The Spirit of Anarchy is the title of my message. I've been doing a series called Contending for the Faith, and this is part six. You can catch the other parts if you missed them on YouTube. The Spirit of Anarchy. And I want to get started here today. Uh, first, a quick little review. We've been studying the Contend for the Faith series is based on the book of Jude. We've been working our way through the book of Jude. And a quick review of last week, we asked, are we planting to the next generation? Like I shared last week, uh, if, if we're self-serving, then what we're going to be planting to is things that benefit ourselves. Are you following me? But if we're thinking about the next generation, then we're going to be planting things in our life that will benefit the next generation. And that's hard to think about sometimes. We talked about, are we giving thought to those who are to follow us? And uh, we talked about everything from stewardship, talked about even this facility, the things we do, we're not always doing for ourselves, we're doing for the future, amen? We've been saving up for a youth building. We've got over $17,000 saved up. Well, right now, we don't have a lot of youth. Why you need a youth building? Well, we're praying and believing that one day we're going to have some youth. Amen? One day these young people are going to turn to teenagers. Amen? And so you're always planting for the future. You can't just think about today. And I think when we just think about today, we get ourselves into trouble. So you always have to think about the next generation to come. And uh, <clears throat> we said that the Father, our Heavenly Father, is always interested in the generation that's to come. Amen? And lastly, we said the tamarisk tree speaks. And the whole thing was based on the fact that Abraham, after he negotiated for a well that he dug, it was his well, with King Abimelech of the Philistines, he then planted a grove of tamarisk trees at that well. And we said when he planted the tamarisk tree, he wasn't planting it for himself because it takes a generation for those to grow, he was planting it for others. We've got several folks from our congregations who are in Israel uh, this week and next week. And one of, uh, who was that came up to me? Somebody came up to me Friday night. It was Raynell. Raynell came up to me Friday night, and she was so excited because some uh, somebody had planted some trees in Israel in memory of some of her loved ones. And she thought that was the coolest thing. Well, how many of you know when you plant a little sapling, you're not planting it just for you because you're not going to enjoy it that much, but for the generations to come. How many of you have ever driven around town and seen some of the beautiful oak trees out here, amen, and some of those other trees that previous generations planted, okay? So today I want to talk about the spirit of anarchy, okay? and how we're to contend for the faith and what it has to do with anarchy and what anarchy means. So I want to start in Jude chapter 1, verse 8 through verse 9. It says, Likewise also these dreamers... Now if you read in context, verse 6, verse 7, it's talking about false teachers that will infiltrate, infiltrate eventually the church. And it talks about some of the characteristics of these individuals. And it goes on and says in verse 8 that likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. And the dignitaries there, because in the next verse we talked about that, verse 9, um, I don't have that up there, but verse 9 goes on to talk about how uh, uh, they give railing accusations against Satan instead of like the archangel Michael who was arguing uh, uh, with Satan about the body of Moses simply said, the Lord rebuke thee. And here the main thing I want to hit on is the reject authority part. And literally in Jude 1.8, we're told that an attribute of false faith is that they reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. Now listen, we have this in spades going on in our nation right now, okay? And I want you to know it doesn't matter what we think of the individual who is president, you still have to have an attitude of respect for the authority of the office. Do you understand what I'm saying? And when you lose that attitude of respect for authority, 
then you end up fighting against God himself. And why do I mean by that is, let me tell you why, is because all authority comes from God. Even authority you don't like, if it's authority, it still comes from God. I'm going to show you that in Scripture. I was not fond of our past President Obama. Matter of fact, I thought he was one of the worst presidents in the history of my life. But, without getting into politics, but that's my personal opinion. But let me say this. I still had respect for the office of the presidency. And I still refuse to speak evil or call him or curse him or all manner of evil things. Are you following me? And I'm telling you, we live in a time where the idea of, of, of authority is just gone out the window. Can you imagine those in the armed forces, Michael will like this analogy, can you imagine if they only obeyed their officer if they liked the man? How, how well would that go over in the military? How many of you served in the military? Kevin, you served as a foot soldier in Afghanistan with a gun in battle, right? Would it have gone over if you told your officer, sir, I'm not going to obey you because I don't like you? <laughs> You'd be in what they call it, Leavenworth, right? In Leavenworth. <laughs> Listen, just because you don't agree or like those who are in authority, you still have to respect that authority. Do you understand that? And I hope by the end of this message you will. Listen to me. There is a spirit at work today that hates any authority and hates any authority as speaking to their lives. Now, part of that goes back to what Miss Beth alluded to, which is, you know, we're a very independent people anyway as a nation, okay? And that's good, but you have to allow authority as speaking to your life sometimes. Boy, it got quiet. Let me say that again. You have to allow authority to speak into your life sometimes. Listen to me. When I was a young man, and even an older man, you all have met my pastor, right? He is my pastor. And there would be times I would go in and talk with him and ask him to speak into my life some areas that he feels needed to be reworked. Okay? Do you know that that never happens anymore? Nobody ever does that. They don't want to hear what somebody in authority has to say about their life. Are you following me? So, listen, you've got to stay open. If you're not open to human authority, what makes you think you're going to be open to God's authority? This is even filtering into the body of Christ, this, this going against authority. You know, it's now where, man... Staff members of churches, they're walking on eggshells all the time because they don't want to offend people. We live in this politically correct society, right? And if you say something, it might offend them. And if I say something to you, like, brother, you know, you need to really work on fixing your children and praying with them or anything, it might offend them. And he'll go down the road. Are you following me? Listen, guys, you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to want... You've got to have that desire in your heart to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you through the authority that's in your life. God can use and will use authority in your life to change you if you let Him. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it hurts. But I'll tell you, it hurts for your good. You ever get disciplined by mom or dad? Amen? Hopefully it was for good. All right. Is there any authority that you allow to speak into your life other than Michael Fanton because he's in the military? <laughs> Is there any authority that you're allowing to speak directly into your life? Don't answer that to me. I want you to think about it for a minute. The answer is no. You need to find somebody that can speak into your life. Plain and simple, guys. I'm just letting you know. Don't be afraid of authority. Do you reject authority in your life, either by word or by action? Learn to love God's ordained authority. Remember I said all authority comes from God? 
You say, well, I don't understand that. How can all authority come from God, even if it's bad authority? Just because the system of authority was ordained by God. Are you following me? It doesn't mean they always do right. You say, is there ever a time to disobey authority? There is. I'm going to show you biblically when those times are. But that's not what we're talking about right now. Right now we're talking about obeying the authority in the land and allowing people to speak truth into your life without your feelings always getting hurt so that God can continue to mold you and transform you and change you. How many of you parents have a hard time speaking into your children's lives? Sometimes. Are they always, oh, thank you, Mom and Dad, for sharing that truth about my life. Is that how they always receive it? No. They don't always receive it with joy. But it's going to work the peaceable fruits of righteousness in their life. Someone say amen. amen. The word anarchy, and this is the reason I use this word, is because it's defined as a state of disorder due to absence or non-recognition of authority. And that's what I see taking place in our country. I see disorder everywhere. And chaos is coming. That's part of the definition, too. And the reason is because of non-recognition of authority. And I'm telling you guys, you don't have to like the authority. Do you understand that? But you have to respect the authority because it comes from God. Doesn't mean you have to agree with the authority, but you have to respect it. It comes from God. Some synonyms, I love this, for anarchy is lawlessness... Wow, that sounds like a biblical term. We're going to look at that. Nihilism, revolution, insurrection, disorder, chaos, mayhem, tumult, and turmoil. And that's what we see taking place and transpiring in the media, in the news, in people's hearts. And to me, it's a symptom of this spirit of lawlessness that's at work in this nation and in the world, that in these end times, the Bible prophesies they will reject authority. And it's going to get worse and not better. But it needs not infect the people of God. Amen? Absence of authority and absolute freedom from the individual is regarded as ideal. In other words, an anarchist, have you heard of Antifa? Antifa is that group on the left coast on California, they wear the, the hoodies and they wear the masks and the face mask and the goggles and they carry baseball bats and uh, they attack prayer meetings and other groupings like that. And uh, this has been going on for, for a while. But their name, even Antifa, is rooted in anarchy. And for them, they want no authority. They want no government. They want nobody telling them what to do. But the thing I want us to understand is there's always going to be some authority in our life. On a spiritual level, the authority is either going to come from God or it's going to come from this fallen planet. Amen? Some authority somewhere is at work in everybody's life, whether they realize it or not. Let's get into the scripture. For the mystery, this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. For the mystery of lawlessness, now remember lawlessness was a synonym of anarchy, and anarchy is without authority or what? Not desiring or not submitting to authority. So here it says the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So the Apostle Paul said even in our time, 2,000 years ago, the spirit of lawlessness, the spirit of anarchy was already at work. But only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, I'll tell you, for the last 2,000 years, people, theologians, have been arguing who the he is. Is the he the Holy Spirit? Is the he the church? I can just tell you that one day, I believe the scripture teaches, due to the rapture of the church, that the church is going to be taken out of the way. And there will be lawlessness and anarchy at that time. And in that void, the Antichrist is going to step in and set up his little world government thingy. And then the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, I'm not making this stuff up, will be revealed. When what? When he who now restrains is taken out of the way. 
You see, I believe the body of Christ is the restraining force on this planet, holding back this tide of anarchy and lawlessness. We are the salt and we are the light. Amen? What's the scripture say? If the salt loses its saltiness, then it's good for nothing. So we as God's people have got to make sure that we ourselves are not lawless, that we're submitted to authority and under authority and under God's authority and under the authority of those that God has put into our lives. Otherwise, we fall into the category of lawlessness. The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Listen to me. There is a deception already at work that creates this chaos and creates this tumult, and that creates this desire to go against authority. It's a deception. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And it's amazing because the people with anarchy at work in their heart, they look at your life and they think that you're wacko. They think that you're crazy. You're a deplorable. Are you following me? But that is just what Satan does in the last days, calling good bad and calling bad good, calling good evil and evil it calls good. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Now, I want to talk to you out of the book of Daniel. Because God doesn't want us believing a lie. He wants to teach us how to submit to authority, human authority. We say, well, I submit to God, but I'm not going to submit to humans. Listen, if you can't submit to the authority in your life, You can't submit to God because by submitting to the authority that's at work in your life, be it a boss, be it a parent, be it anything, you're not submitting to God anyway. Just not. And sometimes you're going to have some people in authority in your life who are wacko. They're crazy. I've had two bosses like that that I worked for. And these folks, one was a woman, one was a man, were crazy I'm talking about mentally out there. I'm not exaggerating. I'm telling you the truth. But you know what? And they always paired me up with the worst case scenario because Bruce, he's a Christian. We'll just give him these guys that nobody else can handle. It really wasn't funny. It was really hard. It's one of the toughest times of my life because you're being asked to submit to authority that is way out there. Daniel is a great study, and we're going to look at that this morning, of submitting to authority. When you think of Daniel, you think of a prophet of God, you think of a man of God, you think of somebody who spoke into the future, you think of all these things, but you need to know Daniel was not just a godly man, he was a godly man who served some really wicked kings. And he served in their cabinet. Wow, can you imagine? That would be like some of you who maybe weren't fond of the previous president serving in his cabinet. I could never do that. Daniel had a grasp of this authority thing, and I think there's a lot to be said for it. I think there's a lot we can learn from it. Daniel came to serve Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonian Empire from 605 to 562 B.C. And I did the math for you. It was 43 years. Okay, So for 43 years of his life, Daniel served Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel was a Jew. They had been taken captive to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of his life, gave his life to the Lord. Did you know that? He got saved. Got very saved, extremely saved. After he ate grass like a cow for seven years, God humbled him. But before all the grass eating and before his salvation, he was a pretty wicked king. And Daniel was serving him. Daniel chapter 5 describes a king or ruler named Belshazzar, whom Daniel served. This was the second king. This king was so wicked, he saw the hand of God writing on the wall, saying that his kingdom, translated, would be taken from him that very night. 
In that very night, the media Persians broke in through the gates, came in through the waterway in secret, took over the city and killed Belshazzar. Daniel served that wicked guy too. Next, Daniel served Darius the Mede. If I were Daniel, I would have been, Lord, can't you give me a righteous king, please? Just one. Next, Daniel served Darius the Mede, also known as Cyrus the Great of the Persian Empire. So Daniel served three wicked kings. Now, Cyrus the Great, out of all of them, was probably the least wicked, if you had to categorize them. Daniel and his companions contended for the faith. So let's step back and look at when Daniel and his three companions, who were taken captive as teenagers and brought into Babylon, Daniel's three companions, we know them as who? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay? Uh, they were not eating of the king's meat to obey God. This is Daniel chapter 1, verse 12 and verse 15. It says, please test your servants for 10 days. Now, why didn't they want to eat the king's meat to obey God? Remember I told you that there are conditions where we can go against authority. That only condition is when authority asks you to do something that brings you into disobedience to God. Are you following me? God says, thou shalt not murder. Authority commands you to murder. Who are you going to obey, God or man? Authority says, thou shalt not preach in the name of Jesus Christ. Remember? Well, whom should we obey, God or man? So the only time that we're to disobey authority is if authority directly violates the word of God. Are you understanding that? All right. So here you say, well, how do authority violate the word of God? Because God had told them to keep kosher, to eat certain foods and not to eat other foods. And by sitting and eating the king's meat, guess what? They were being fed pig, they were being fed all these things that they knew God had commanded them not to eat. And I'm not on the kosher kick, I'm just telling you the truth of what it was. So by them not eating the king's meat to obey God, they told the uh, head of, of the king's household, they said, look, test us for 10 days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Okay, because there is no unkosher vegetable. You follow me? Yes, Pastor, we understand. At the end of 10 days, they're fe- they're, <laughs> there's no bacon asparagus, Josh, sorry. <laughs> and at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate a portion of the king's delicacies. So I want you to understand that the issue was not that it was the king's food. The issue was it was food that hadn't been prepared according to the way that God had declared he wanted them to eat as Jewish people. Do you understand me? <clears throat> so here they didn't, they, they, they said, test us, and their flesh was pinker, and they were fatter and healthier than the rest of the people who were eating all the king's meat. So Daniel and his companions contended for the faith by, oh, here on this one, not bowing down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue, and not disobeying God with their diet. Here in Daniel 3.15, now remember, all this was under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And he says, now if you're ready at the time, you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. Just to give you a little background, he made a statue of himself. And he ordered everyone in the kingdom at the time they hear the music to fall down, to bow down, to worship at the foot of the statue. How many of you know you have to be pretty hooked on yourself for all that? That was Nebuchadnezzar before he got saved. And you shall fall down and worship the statue, the image which I've made. Good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? <laughs> Sorry, verse 18. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. So why did they disobey the authority? 
because the authority commanded them to bow down and worship another god. And they said, we will not serve your gods. So again, the only time that God's people are permitted scripturally and biblically to disobey authority in your life is that if the authority directly asks you to go against the word of God. If they ask you to bow your knee and worship a statue, it's a good idea if you don't. Someone say amen. amen. Now what's amazing about this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we don't know where Daniel was in the midst of this, but there was three of them. Do you know that there were tens of thousands of Jews who were ready to bow their knee and worship the false image? And out of those, only three that were saying, I'm willing to stand up for the faith, contend for the faith, fight for the good, fight for what's right, and obey God. Only three out of all of them. You know, I read a story this week. In, in the uh, news, there was a Muslim terrorist attack in the nation of Kenya this week. They attacked a bus. And what they did is they took over the bus and they separated the Christians from the Muslims. Well, all of them were Muslims except for three Christians on the bus. And they gave the Christians this. This happened this week. You can look it up. They gave these three Christians this one opportunity. They said, confess and become Muslim by saying this prayer with us or die. One of them gave up his faith in Jesus to save his life. The other two said, we will not bow our knee. And they died for their faith this week in Kenya. Are you following me? So I'm telling you that this stuff is real. This stuff is going on around the world today. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. <laughs> of course he was, because his order was being disobeyed. And the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And you can read the rest of the story in your own time, but as you know the story, it got so hot that the guys who were throwing them into the fire burned up themselves. I mean, it smoked the soldiers, burned them up. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went in there and their ropes burned off, and they're walking around in there, and it says, a fourth man likened unto the Son of God was walking in there with them. I say, yes, thank God for men and women of God who will stand up and contend for the faith when it needs contending. Amen? Submit to authority. Do the best you can to respect authority in your life. But if authority tells you to disobey God, you always obey the ultimate authority before man. Always. Daniel and his companions contended for the faith by Daniel continuing to pray regardless of man's law. They made a law telling Daniel he could not pray. You know, three weeks ago, they nearly passed a law, nearly made it a law in California that was outlawed Bibles being sold came this close. I'm not making this stuff up. I know it sounds nuts, but it's true. Daniel 6, 7 through 11, all the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors. Now, this was some guys trying to trap Daniel. They hated Daniel. And so they go to the king and they're like, king, all the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, the advisors, they've all called a meeting and consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except for you, O king, shall be cast into a den of lions. For 30 days... Yeah, you know, we just all got together and we were having lunch one day and we just decided, you know, we love the king so much. Nobody can seek advice from a god or anything else except from the king. And let's go to the king and make this a law. No, they were trying literally to find a way to stop Daniel and to trap Daniel and to have Daniel put to death. Listen, guys, for the fact that 
non-believers hate believers. That's not anything new. Jesus said they hated me. They're going to what? Hate you. They don't even know why they do. It's just at work. That spirit of lawlessness at work in their hearts. Are you following me? And the brighter and the more that you and I shine for Jesus, the more distinct that gulf is going to become. And the louder and more vocal these individuals are going to become. Do you understand that? So what happened here with Daniel? Now, O king, establish the decree, sign the writing so they cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. In other words, once the king made a declaration, there was no going back and changing it. It was law. It was written. It was done. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, when Daniel knew, everybody say he knew. I love this verse. If you highlight anything, if you write anything down, if you take a note, take a note of verse 10. I love this verse. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows what? Open toward Jerusalem. He didn't say, oh, there's a law here. Now I'm going to have to hide and close his windows. He opened them toward Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. He said, you know what? This is what I do. I pray and I seek God, and I'll not change for any law that man makes. And he kept the window wide open, and they purposely looked because they knew exactly, his enemies knew exactly where Daniel was going to be. Isn't that a beautiful thing when your enemies know that you're going to be on your knees praying and seeking God? I love that, amen? I shared with you guys at Revive Texas. We had, we said we had, what, 663 people come to Jesus, real conversions. About 500 of those were students at the schools. But you cannot poke a hornet's nest without stirring some stuff up. Okay, so what happened is this. One of the guys made a Facebook post. I'm telling you, sometimes we need just a little more wisdom when not to make Facebook posts. Amen? Somebody made a Facebook post, and I'm telling you, these people from another state were looking at this stuff and saw it, and they contacted the school district and said, you know, this is going on in your schools. And they ended up taking the head of the FCA and banning him from saying foot in any of the schools in Abilene ISD. Now, how do you think that man felt? Now, think about this. Then they went a step further. I'm going to tell you what happened. Then they went a step further. This was two weeks ago. And last week... Uh, At the beginning of the week, they said, you know what? We're just banning FCA. And for a few short days, they banned FCA on every campus. Well, how many of you know that didn't go over well with the parents? Amen? So the parents, the students, everything. I mean, everybody was just up in arms. And they reversed that ban. Now we're praying that they're going to reverse the ban on this guy. And listen to me. I'm telling you guys that... In Taylor County, I think I shared this with you last week, in Taylor County, they received a letter commanding them to make sure that every employee's desk is free from any cross, any Bible, any religious, anything on their desk. And because the Taylor County courthouse had had a sign advertising for the Ben Ritchie bake sale or something, to support the Ben Ritchie Boys Home, that they were supporting a religious organization. Well, make a long story short, then the Christian folks got involved, and they wrote a letter saying, don't you dare make those people take that stuff off their desk, because that's not... And then you get into this great big, everybody's up in arms. But I want you to see past all of that stuff and all that noise, and I want you to see it. There is a spirit at work in these last days to try to remove... God from every facet of public and private life. Amen? 
And that spirit is growing stronger and bolder by the day. And as Christians, we need to stand against that spirit in a spirit of love. You cannot react to hatred with hatred. Someone say amen. God commands us to do what to our enemies? Love them. Amen. You can't always be rebuking people. Amen. You got to love people. It doesn't mean you agree with them. I think the reason that Daniel was able to be so successful with these kings and why they loved him and trust him so much is I think it was because of the fact that he loved those he served. Didn't agree with them, but I think he loved God and I think he recognized he needed to love the individual. You can love people without agreeing with them. Can someone say amen? Yeah. Let me say that again. You can love individuals. You can love Muslims without agreeing with them. Yeah. Amen? Amen. And I'm telling you what, guys, as a church, we've got to learn to love people we don't agree with because the disagreements are going to get louder and more vocal. And this was prophesied. It's not just in our nation. It's a spirit that's affecting the entire planet. And the only thing I see that could change that and would change has a great awakening in our nation. God can do that, amen? But until that comes, how do we combat the onslaught of the enemy? with the spirit of love, by obeying the authority in our life, unless the authority asks you to stop serving God. So what happened with Daniel? Let me tell you. So Daniel said, you know what? I know that the law was signed today, so I'm going to still continue to pray three times a day, just like I always have. And they arrested him. They took him before the king. And the king loved Daniel. says he loved him. And then he, the king realized how proud he had been in making that law. And he wanted to save him from the lion's den, but he couldn't do it. So he threw Daniel into the lion's den, and the king fasted and prayed for Daniel. Isn't that amazing? Fasted and prayed for him. And as you know, God sent the angels, and the angels closed the mouth of the lions. And the next day, the king goes down, first one down there, Oh, Daniel, Daniel, are you there? Are you still alive? Daniel, of course, he'd been hanging out all night watching the angels holding the mouth of the lion. Oh, king, I'm fine. Oh, thank God, Daniel. Has the stone rolled away. Now the king's so happy that Daniel survived miraculously, and he's so upset at those who tricked him into passing that silly law, that he orders all them to take their turn in the lion's den. And he cast every one of them into the same den with the same lions. Well, how do you think those lions felt after seeing their meal and not being able to partake of it all night? They were probably a little extra mad and extra hungry. So they had themselves a little bit of a feast, not to be gross, but I'm just telling you what the scripture says, and they munched. <clears throat> so the moral of the story in our life, guys, and I'm going to close with this thought. Allow God to speak into your life his authority, Allow him to speak through the authorities put into your life. Did you know God can use even unsaved bosses in your life to work and mold you and shape you and change you? Amen. Work patience in you. Work other things in you. He can work any authority in your life. And the only time God ever gives us permission to disobey that authority is if it's a direct violation of his word. Amen. Let's pray.